Protesters were out in the streets in Kenya again Thursday, demonstrating against the high cost of living and recent tax hikes. This comes after opposition leader Lila Dinga called for a three-day demonstration that started Wednesday. Protesters showed up for a second day in a law in some parts of Nairobi and elsewhere in the country, demonstrating against what they say is a cost of living that's been drastically going up for each and every day. The three-day demonstrations that started Wednesday, led by opposition leader Lilo Dinger, has seen 300 people reportedly arrested, including several senior opposition leaders. Some were in court Thursday to respond to accusations of looting, assaulting police, and destroying property. David Omoyo, head of Kenya's media council, said one police officer masqueraded as a reporter to arrest a protester. Kenyan President William Luto addressing residents of Isiolo County on Thursday urged residents to maintain peace, saying that destruction of property during the demonstrations will affect development of the country. Every part of Kenya has said we cannot sabotage our economy using violence and destruction of business, destruction of property, he said. Kenya is the only place we have to call home and we must protect it by all means. On Thursday, veteran opposition leader Odinga wrote on Twitter, the voice of the people must be heard and insisted the peaceful protests continue. Vincent Kimosop, an economist, policy and governance expert based in Nairobi said it's important to analyze the impact of recent events. This comes after opposition leader Raila Odinga called for a three-day demonstration that started on Wednesday. Viewers Nairobi Bureau Chief Maria Madialo reports. Protesters showed up for a second day in a row in some parts of Nairobi and elsewhere in the country against what they say is a cost of living that's been drastically going up each and every day. The three-day demonstrations that started on Wednesday and led by opposition leader Raila Odinga have seen 300 people reportedly arrested, including several senior opposition leaders. Some were in court on Thursday to respond to accusations of looting, assaulting police, and destroying property. One police officer masqueraded as a reporter to arrest a protester, says David Amwo. The head of Kenya's media council. What we saw was uh, a policeman in civilian clothing who was among the journalists, the press corps, during demonstrations in one of the suburbs in Nairobi. And then suddenly he put his um, camera or phone in the pocket and jumped across, grabbed one of the protesters and dragged him across. Then the other policeman immediately joined him. I think it was like a setup. And then he dragged one protester and then threw him into their police vehicle. Amoyo told VOA this is the first of its kind and it's scary for members of the media. Our fear is that uh, the perception of uh, the protesters or the public that uh, police could masquerade as journalists because we have had running battles between police and uh, protesters with a few projectile stones thrown at each other. Then the protesters who of course agitated and angry with the tear gas and all that could end up attacking uh, members of the press and journalists, accusing them of being the police. Kenyan President William Ruto, addressing residents of Isiolo County on Thursday, urged residents to maintain peace, saying that destruction of property during the demonstrations will affect development of the country. Every part of Kenya have said we cannot sabotage our economy using violence and destruction of business and destruction of property. Kenya is the only place we have to call home and we must protect it by all means. On Thursday, veteran opposition leader Odinga wrote on Twitter, the voice of the people must be heard and insisted the peaceful protest continue. Vincent Kimosap, an economic policy and governance expert based in Nairobi, says it's important to analyze the impact of recent events. If you look at the impact of the disruptions that were brought by the war in Ukraine, the disruption of the global supply chains uh, with COVID-19, 
And for close to two years, we shut uh, the engines of economic production while at the same time pushing into subsidies, allowing people to access monies. So the monies that are being pushed to facilitate people through a such situation, of course, uh, when you shut down economic engines, what happens? You are basically preparing for inflation. The protests are expected to continue Friday. Mariama Jalo, VOA News, Nairobi. A spokesperson for the M23 rebels operating in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo says the group did not ban a radio program produced by displaced journalists. The Committee to Protect Journalists this week accused the M23 of censorship by banning the current affair show called Soti Yawahami that is broadcast on Top Congo FM. M23 political spokesperson Lawrence Kanyuka says the group does not censor what radio stations should or should not report. However, Kanyuka tells me that he sent a letter to Top Congo FM on July 14 asking the station to stop carrying the program until there is a review on August 10th. Kanyuka says the M23 wants the show to stop hosting people who preach hatred and division. First of all, let me tell you, uh, we don't ban any radios purposely for other reason than the coalition of communities living together. So all the radios, including Voice of Americas and all stations are broadcast, no, all radios in our areas. It is only Top Congo, which is a radio sponsored by the DRC government that spread hatred and division, exclusion. That's why we said we don't want to carry on with propaganda of division, hate speech, genocide ideology broadcast within the area. We even contacted the top Congo. We told them that we actually don't want division. So the hate speech is at a level where it's become toxic. That's why we said we need to prevent all these things getting out of proportion. So therefore, we told top Congo to work for the time being. But uh, Lawrence, the report here says that uh, on July 14, you sent letters to four, I think it's Radio Horizon, FM, Radio Communicator, Radio Alliance, and Radio Rakov to stop carrying the program. Is that correct? I've already sent a message to the radio station to stop for the time being until we have a review on the 10th of August. I sent the message to them and I told them we need to stop broadcasting people that are bringing hate speeches. So we don't control the programs. They actually publish everything they published, but they will request for us to bring the living together to stop hate speech. That's why we said this program that comes from Goma and the DRC government side of control of countries, bringing stuff back to the area we are, I said, okay, let us have a review. So we're going to meet on the 10th of uh, August for us to discuss together what is the way forward, what we really want. Lawrence Kanyuka is the political spokesperson for M23 Rebels in DRC. He was speaking with me from Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Malawi's Vice President Salus Chilima has asked the court to vary some of his bail conditions in his corruption case. A chief resident magistrate court in Malawi released Chilima on bail last year, soon after the Anti-Corruption Bureau arrested him in November. He was charged with allegedly receiving payments amounting to $280,000 and other items from British businessman Zunef Sattar in return for the award of Malawi government contracts. However, Chalema's lawyers told the court on Wednesday that the bill conditions were not reasonable. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. Among the bill conditions were that Chilima should be reporting to the anti-corruption bureau offices once every three months. He should also surrender his travel documents to court and seek approval before he travels outside the country. Kumbo Soko is one of the Chilima's lawyers. He told reporters outside the financial crimes court that the bail conditions do not serve any purpose except to humiliate Chilima. The argument we're presenting is that if you look at the, uh, the caliber of the defendant, 
uh, who is in court, the high office which he occupies, there can be no suspicion that he's going to run away. You know, so there's, to that extent, therefore, uh, no justification for having this condition. Exceptionist, for what? Soko also said there was no need for Chirima to surrender his travel documents because he is always surrounded by security officers, which guarantees his availability. However, the presiding judge, Redson Kapindu, wondered if the vice president would not request security around him for privacy. Kareke Nikapale, another defense lawyer, responded by saying Chirima cannot ask for privacy for three months. Chirima is facing six counts of corrupt practices by a public officer profiting from government contracts and failing to make full report to the officers of the bureau. In June of last year, Malawi's President Lazarus Chakwera suspended the powers of the Vice President Chirima after his arrest. Anti-corruption bureau lawyer Crispin Kunga objected to the changes in the application of Chirima's bail, saying the conditions were reasonable. He cited as an example of another former vice president of Malawi, Kasim Chirumpa, who was arrested for treason. His travel documents were surrendered and he was required to visit the police station every week. In response, the presiding judge Gavindu asked why the ACB would not rely on police in the Chirima case. The SCB said this case is different. Hirari Chilomba is Deputy Director General for the Anti-Corruption Bureau. We said that no to the violation of bail, opposing the application which was done by our colleagues. So we're satisfied with the way the arguments have taken place. We should respect the lower court which actually came up with uh, the bail conditions because uh, when the court was coming on the decision, they knew that it was the vice president. So we stick to that. On the other issue, of course, you argue to say that this is a new case in Malawi. The presiding judge, Red Sonika Bindu, said he would make a ruling on the matter in early August when Chirima is expected to take a plea to charges leveled against him.